1966, a remarkable gathering took place, bringing together some of the most formidable mob bosses for a dinner. This event was not an anomaly. For years, influential mobsters had convened in public settings, sharing meals without facing repercussions. Notably, in the regions dominated by the Southern Mafia, it was commonplace for Mafia leaders to dine alongside police officers, sheriffs, judges, senators and politicians from across the country, with their interactions going unquestioned. However, the gathering in 1966 marked a pivotal moment, as events took a significant and unexpected turn. Nine years prior in 1957, an event colloquially known as the Appalachian Meeting inadvertently thrust the Mafia into the public eye, marking what many consider the moment the organization was outed. Following this exposure, the 1960 election saw John F. Kennedy ascend to the presidency, with his inauguration taking place in 1961. Tragically, in 1963, Kennedy was assassinated, a pivotal moment in American history. Fast forward three years, and the very architects of the underworld, those influential men, convened once again. This time their meeting was set against the backdrop of one of New York's most esteemed establishments, La Stella Restaurant, where they gathered to share a meal, underscoring the complex interweaving of power, politics and secrecy that characterized the era. Throughout the 30s, 40s and 50s, figures such as Maya Lansky, Frank Costello and Carlos Marcello, along with the Marcello crime family, Frank Todaro and the Todaro crime family, Silver Dollar Sam and his son Anthony Carolla, as well as Carlos Marcello's extended network of brothers and cousins, including Joseph, Marcello Jr., Anthony Marcello, Pascal Marcello, Vincent Marcello, Salvador Marcello, Peter Marcello, and the Traficante crime family, were prominent figures in Florida, as well as New Orleans, Louisiana. These men and their associates openly frequented restaurants across the region, maintaining a presence that went unchallenged. No one dared to confront or stop them. However, the landscape of power and impunity began to shift dramatically by the late 50s and early 60s. The Kennedy administration emerged as a pivotal force of change, challenging the once untouchable status of these mob figures. Within just three years of this political upheaval, the very men who once dined in public without concern found themselves unable to do so, marking a significant transformation in the relationship between organized crime and public visibility. The era of operating in the open had come to an end, signifying a new chapter in the battle against organized crime. For one individual, the changing dynamics of the 60s posed a significant dilemma, primarily due to the swirling questions about his activities especially over the last three years. His attempts to distance himself from the mob were undermined by his past, particularly during the early 50s when he was first interrogated by the Kefauver Committee. Opting to remain silent, he refused to acknowledge any connections to well-known mob figures like Frank Costello and Maya Lansky, as well as other mobsters from New York or Chicago. New York had always grappled with the challenge of its gangsters, Achieving notoriety, with famous figures like Arnold Rothstein and his sensational death, Dutch Schultz, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, Joe Masseria, alongside prominent mobsters such as Charlie Luciano and Frank Costello. Costello's 1949 feature in Time magazine elevated him to one of the most recognized mob figures in America. Similarly, Chicago faced its share of publicized gangsters like Al Capone, Tony Accardo, Paul Rieker and Frank Nitti, who were all household names, notorious to both authorities and the general public. However, the intricate operations of organized crime remained largely misunderstood, with few recognizing that these figures were investing vast sums of money across America, including significant investments in Louisiana since the 30s. It was Carlos Marcello who emerged as one of the most formidable figures in this landscape. His power stemmed from the trust placed in him by the entirety of the National Mafia, including New York and Chicago's most influential mobsters. Marcello was seen as the custodian of a billion-dollar empire, with Frank Costello and Luciano referring to him as the best investment of their lives. 
Louisiana became a crucial hub for organized crime, serving as both the heart of communication and a center for money laundering. Marcello's influence expanded during the fight against Castro, highlighting his strategic importance in the broader operations of organized crime. Despite the challenges of the 1960s, including increasing scrutiny and his alleged connections to the Kennedy assassination, Marcello's name remained synonymous with the power and reach of the Mafia. His leadership signified a pivotal era in organized crime, where the complexities and scale of operations were underpinned by strategic investments and alliances, shaping the underworld in ways that would resonate for decades to come. In 1966, a pivotal meeting was convened for several pressing reasons. Among the key figures present, one loyal associate of Luciano was grappling with a grave health diagnosis, a brain tumour, with only a limited time left to live. This situation necessitated a successor to oversee his family affairs, presenting Carlo Gambino with a significant challenge to address. In response, Gambino reached out to an old ally, Carlos Marcello, who was facing his own set of problems within his crime family. Delving deeper into Carlos Marcello's life reveals a complex web of power dynamics. The original leader of Marcello's crime family was Silver Dollar Sam, who, despite being exiled to Sicily in 1947, continued to exert influence from afar. However, Carlos Marcello emerged as the local figurehead responsible for the family's activities. Over time, Marcello proved to be an even more formidable force, not only preserving Silver Dollar Sam's $200 million empire, but also expanding his own to a staggering $2 billion. This success earned Marcello considerable respect and admiration from the wider Mafia community, including those in New York. Marcello was known for his willingness to assist fellow mobsters in need, never hesitating to intervene, even if it brought him trouble to secure favor within the Mafia. His philosophy was one of mutual aid, a favor for a favor, ensuring loyalty and support within the criminal underworld. Marcello's influence extended to corrupting judges to benefit the Mafia, showcasing his reach and power. However, his downfall was precipitated by a sting operation set up by the FBI, targeting him as he attempted to corrupt a judge to aid a fellow mobster. This episode underscored Martello's readiness to go to great lengths to support his Mafia colleagues. The meeting in 1966 also marked a crucial moment for the crime family's leadership. Silver Dollar Sam, despite his exile, he had returned with the aid of his daughter and son. Sam now planned to transfer control of the family to his son. Marcello, desperate to maintain his leadership, sought the support of the broader Mafia to assert that he should remain the boss, regardless of Silver Dollar Sam's wishes. This move was aimed at solidifying Marcello's position at the helm of the family, ensuring his leadership would continue unchallenged even after Silver Dollar Sam's demise. When Tommy Lucchese fell ill, Carlo Gambino found himself in need of Carlos Marcello's support on the council to facilitate the ascension of Anthony Tony Dux Corallo as the new boss of the Lucchese family. Gambino, confident in his alliances, knew he could count on figures like Joseph Colombo and the support from key members of the Genovese family, Mike Miranda and Tommy Eboli, further solidified his position. In exchange, Marcello received Gambino's backing to remain the undisputed leader of his own family. To celebrate these understandings and solidify their agreement, a distinguished dinner was organized on September 22nd, bringing together notable figures from various crime families. The guest list for this significant event read like a who is who of the Mafia elite. Mike Miranda, a senior figure in the Genovese family, took the place at the head of the table. Joseph Colombo, the boss of the Colombo family, was seated next to Miranda, symbolizing his importance in the gathering. Tommy Eberly and Dominic Alonghi, both high-ranking members of the Genovese family, were also in attendance, showcasing the Genovese family's strong presence. Joseph Martello Jr., representing the Martello family and brother to Carlos Martello, was strategically placed among the influential attendees, Agnello Della Croce, the underboss of the Gambino crime family, 
and Joseph N. Gallo, another Gambino family member, highlighted the Gambino family's influential role. Frank Galliano and Anthony Carolla, the latter being the son of Silver Dollar Sam, connected the gathering to historical mafia roots. Traficante Jr. and Carlos Marcello were present, with Marcello positioned next to Carlo Gambino, underscoring their pivotal roles and close alliance. This assembly of mafia powerhouses underscored the intricate web of alliances, rivalries, and mutual interests that defined the operations of organized crime during this era. The dinner on September 22nd was not just a social occasion, but a strategic meeting that reinforced the existing power structures and agreements within the American Mafia. Carlos Marcello reflected on the ordeal with a mixture of disbelief and resignation, recounting, We barely walked in, hadn't even placed our orders, when we were arrested and taken straight to the police station. This incident catapulted Carlos Marcello, already a towering figure in organized crime, into the national spotlight. Newspapers across New York and his native Louisiana plastered his face on their front pages, marking him not just as a mobster, but as an object of fascination. The public, especially in Louisiana, was captivated by the idea that one of their own was influential enough to sit alongside New York's most powerful mafia families. The arrest sparked widespread speculation about the purpose of the meeting, with rumors quickly spreading that Marcello's status as the boss of bosses was under threat from the returning Silver Dollar Sam. This newfound media attention was the last thing Marcello desired, especially so soon after the Kennedy assassination, a period when he preferred to maintain a lower profile. The speculation and rumors only intensified the media frenzy pushing the Marcello crime family back into the limelight, a place Marcello was keen to avoid. Despite his efforts to control the narrative, Marcello's own actions and the circumstances surrounding him only fueled public interest and speculation, making his situation increasingly difficult to navigate. Upon his return to New Orleans, Carlos Marcello received a tumultuous welcome. The scene was chaotic, brimming with press photographers, and an FBI agent who had been keeping tabs on him for quite some time. This agent, Special Agent Patrick Collins, made his way through the throng to confront Marcello. Whatever Collins said to Marcello ignited a fiery response, with Marcello retorting loudly, I am the boss. In a moment of anger, Marcello shoved someone aside and landed a punch on the FBI agent's face. Marcello later claimed ignorance of Collins's identity as an FBI agent, suggesting his actions were spurred by sheer anger rather than personal vendetta. Despite this, some argue Marcello was well aware of whom he was attacking. This incident, though occurring in 1966, did not lead to immediate consequences for Marcello. It was not until 1970 that he faced punishment, serving a brief sentence and paying a $5,000 fine. Nonetheless, this event began to weave a complex narrative connecting various figures across Louisiana and Texas, particularly in New Orleans and Dallas. The public's dissatisfaction with the Warren report, which failed to quell their thirst for answers regarding the Kennedy assassination, only deepened the intrigue. Witnesses called upon to testify discovered alterations to their statements, prompting journalists to delve deeper. Conversations about Lee Harvey Oswald's ties to Jack Ruby and Ruby's links to organized crime began to surface. Carlos Marcello, Guy Bannister, and the activities of Cuban exiles and their murky connections with the CIA and the Mafia became topics of fervent discussion. It was clear to many in New Orleans that the Mafia, with Marcello at the helm, had a significant role in these events. For Marcello, the situation was becoming increasingly dire. With Robert Kennedy still alive, the Mafia did not perceive John Kennedy as a direct threat, but recognized the necessity of dealing with John to ultimately target Robert. Robert Kennedy's potential political resurgence, eyeing a senatorial seat with aspirations for the presidency, represented Marcello's worst fear. It was imperative for Marcello to act setting the stage for a dark chapter in American history. In the secretive meeting in New York, 
the mobsters discussed a matter they believed was confidential, yet it inevitably leaked to various sources. The focal point of their conversation was the imprisonment of Jimmy Hoffa, who was imprisoned in 1967, a direct result of Robert Kennedy's aggressive actions against organized crime. Amid this turbulent backdrop, Carlos Martello had to confront a significant threat in Louisiana, a notorious informant named Ed Partin. Partin, instrumental in Hoffa's conviction, seemingly underestimated the gravity of crossing paths with Marcello. Although aware of Marcello's reputation, Partin failed to grasp the full extent of Marcello's influence and power. Hoffa, harboring a deep-seated desire to eliminate Robert Kennedy, allegedly approached Parton while inebriated, suggesting he contact connections in the South to handle Kennedy. Despite Partin's lack of directees to Marcello, Hoffa's assumption placed Partin in a precarious position. Acting on Hoffa's threat, Partin relayed the information to Kennedy, effectively becoming an insider informant for the Kennedy camp. In response to this complex web of betrayal and intrigue, Carlos Marcello was reportedly allocated a budget of $2 million in late 1966 to orchestrate Hoffa's release from prison. This period also saw Marcello gaining significant media attention, further complicating the narrative. The incarceration of Sam Momo Giancana in 1965 marked a pivotal moment for the Chicago outfit, leading to significant organizational shifts. Giancana's refusal to testify under an offer of immunity before a federal grand jury investigating organized crime in the Chicago area led to his imprisonment for contempt. This event prompted the return of Tony Accardo to the forefront of the organization, assuming control and steering the outfit through a turbulent period. Released on May 31, 1966, Giancana's freedom was short-lived. Seeking refuge, he fled to Latin America, only to be expelled by Mexican authorities on July 19, 1974. During his absence, the Chicago outfit, under the stewardship of Ocado and Paul Rica, underwent strategic changes, particularly in the realm of gambling operations, which were a significant source of income for the organization. The 1966 meeting, while not directly addressing the internal dynamics of the Chicago outfit, acknowledged the seamless transition of leadership back to Ocado and Rica. This shift underscored the outfit's resilience and adaptability in the face of legal challenges and leadership vacuums. Giancana's imprisonment and subsequent flight was a direct repercussion of the Kennedy administration's aggressive crackdown on organized crime, illustrating the far-reaching impact of political policies on the criminal underworld. This period of upheaval within the Chicago outfit exemplifies the interconnectedness of politics, law enforcement, and organized crime during the mid-20th century. After President John Kennedy's assassination in 1963, Many figures in the underworld naively believed that their operations would soon return to business as usual. However, they gravely underestimated the situation. The assassination was merely a skirmish in an ongoing war between the Kennedy administration and organized crime, a battle the mob thought they had won, but the conflict was far from over. The aggressive stance of the Kennedy administration towards organized crime did not end with JFK's death. It had set into motion a series of events that continued to challenge the Mafia's operations. The Mafia found itself embroiled in a sort of cold war with federal authorities, characterized by espionage, strategic maneuvering, and a battle for public perception rather than outright confrontations. This secretive war was significantly influenced by the Valachi hearings, which happened weeks before the Kennedy assassination exposed many of the Mafia's operations to the public eye. These hearings marked a shift in strategy, moving the battle against organized crime behind closed doors where the tactics became more subtle, yet no less deadly. This period saw increasing frustration among certain FBI agents who believed that J. Edgar Hoover was not utilizing available intelligence to its fullest extent against the Mafia. In response, some agents left the FBI to join influential publications such as Life magazine, The Evening Post, and Time magazine. 
Through these platforms, they launched a concerted effort to expose and undermine organized crime. Their work helped to bring significant attention to the Mafia's activities, educating the American public on how the Mafia had built its empire and how it continued to operate. For Carlos Marcello, this heightened scrutiny and public exposure were untenable. The spotlight on organized crime threatened not only his personal safety, but also the stability of his empire and the well-being of his family. Marcello recognized the need for a strategic retreat to allow the dust to settle. He aimed to demonstrate to his crime family and to his rivals that he was still in control and capable of protecting their collective interests. Marcello's response to these challenges was to navigate through this period of increased pressure with a combination of caution and resilience, striving to maintain his power and influence amidst a rapidly changing landscape of organized crime and law enforcement. Jim Garrison, the district attorney of New Orleans, Louisiana, had complex and controversial connections with the organized crime network, particularly with Carlos Marcello, the reputed local mafia boss. Garrison's living arrangements and associations provided a stark illustration of the deep entanglement between politics and organized crime in Louisiana during his tenure. He resided rent-free in a property owned by a captain linked to Marcello's crime family called Frank Occupinti and the house. Garrison lived in with his family was actually built by Frank Occupinti, a known associate of Marcello, underscored the blurred lines between Garrison's official duties and his personal relationships with figures in the criminal underworld. Despite the clear connections and favors received from individuals within Marcello's circle, Garrison publicly described Marcello as an honorable man and a mere tomato salesman, not a mafiosi, even in the face of substantial evidence to the contrary. This portrayal came during the House Select Committee hearings on assassinations in 1975 highlighting the extent to which Garrison was perceived to be under the influence or control of organized crime. The political landscape of Louisiana at the time seemed to be heavily influenced, if not outright controlled, by Marcello's operations. This influence was so pervasive that when Garrison initiated an investigation into the Kennedy assassination, Robert F. Kennedy remarked that Garrison's failure to arrest Marcello indicated that his investigation might be conducted on Marcello's behalf. Garrison's investigation, which famously included figures like David Ferry, often appeared to be stymied or diverted when it neared individuals connected to Marcello. Ferry, a pilot and associate of Marcello, became a significant figure in Garrison's investigation, but was only seriously considered a suspect after his death. Despite interviewing Ferry shortly after the assassination and uncovering his connections to Marcello, Garrison took no immediate action against him. Similarly, Garrison's investigations into Guy Bannister, another associate of Marcello, yielded no substantial actions despite clear evidence of Bannister's involvement with Marcello on the day of the assassination. Garrison's inquiry also touched on Ed Partin, a figure who had testified against Jimmy Hoffa. Garrison aimed to discredit Partin, possibly to undermine the case against Hoffa, and by extension damage Partin's credibility. However, Partin remained steadfast, selling his story to Life magazine, which inadvertently escalated his conflict with Marcello, and led to Partin leaving Louisiana, never to return. If Garrison was indeed conducting an investigation to seek justice for the Kennedy assassination, Aiming to continue Robert F. Kennedy's legacy of combating organized crime, his actions seem paradoxical, particularly in his treatment of Ed Partin. Partin, who played a crucial role in the prosecution of Jimmy Hoffa, a major target of Robert Kennedy's crackdown on organized crime, should have been seen as an ally in Garrison's purported quest for justice. However, Garrison's vendetta against Partin appears to align more closely with the interests of Carlos Marcello a notorious mafia figure, than with those of seeking justice for the Kennedy assassination or honoring Robert Kennedy's efforts against organized crime. By aggressively pursuing Partin, Garrison could have been perceived as working to undermine one of Robert Kennedy's significant achievements, 
rather than advancing the cause of justice for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. This approach suggests that Garrison's investigation might have been influenced, whether directly or indirectly, by Marcello's interests. Marcello had a vested interest in discrediting Partin. Given Partin's testimony against Hoffa, which had detrimental effects on the organized crime network. My documentation of these events in articles from Look Life and Time magazines serves as a crucial expose, shedding light on the complex and often contradictory nature of Garrison's investigation. By highlighting the apparent conflict between Garrison's stated goals and his actions, my work contributes to the understanding of the intricate web of relationships and interests that may have influenced the investigation into one of the most pivotal and controversial events in American history. This nuanced portrayal underscores the challenges in disentangling the threads of justice, political ambition, and organized crime's influence, offering readers a deeper insight into the tumultuous period following the Kennedy assassination and the ongoing battle against organized crime spearheaded by figures like Robert Kennedy. The complex web of relationships and the apparent protection of Marcello and his associates by Garrison paint a picture of a legal and political system deeply infiltrated by organized crime. Garrison's actions, or lack thereof regarding key figures linked to the Kennedy assassination, suggest a compromised investigation, influenced by his connections to Marcello, thereby shielding significant mafia figures from scrutiny and possible prosecution. Carlos Martello was one of America's most formidable mob bosses, wielding immense power across a vast territory. FBI documents reveal that in the 50s, he was involved in property transactions amounting to around $1 billion, illustrating his immense wealth. His lawyer famously remarked that the only way to remove Martello from Louisiana was by pointing a shotgun at his head. Following the Kennedy assassination, Marcello was aware of some loose ends but underestimated their extent. Stories began to emerge, tracing back to his criminal syndicate and associates like David Ferry, Guy Bannister and others. This narrative also delves into Lee Harvey Oswald's actions, particularly his attempted assassination of Edwin Walker, a political figure whose interests clashed with Marcello's. Oswald's connection to Marcello and the subsequent assassination attempt on Walker highlighted the intricate ties within this criminal network. After the attempt on Walker, Oswald reportedly boasted around Dallas, creating an aura of invincibility around him. This perception, fueled by his connections, might have emboldened him to undertake further audacious acts, believing he could escape the consequences. Carlos Marcello's primary advantage was his ability to remain unlinked to organized crime. He was known to socialize with mobsters in Louisiana, but as the 50s and 60s progressed, he became more cautious with his actions and criminal enterprises. This shift was partly due to a significant personal and public setback during the Kefauver hearings in the 50s, where he was labeled a pimp, narcotics trafficker, and involved in prostitution, activities deemed dishonorable, not just in general society, but also against the values of Sicilian culture, despite his status as a mafioso. This public exposure embarrassed his father, who had established a reputation in Louisiana as an honorable businessman, never directly implicated in illicit activities, yet connected to the major players in organized crime. The accusations deeply affected his father, who, unable to face his community in Louisiana, decided to return to Sicily his homeland, with his wealth. Tragically, he died on the journey back, leaving Marcello heartbroken and fostering a deep resentment towards the authorities in Washington, whom he blamed for his personal loss. Marcello was quoted as expressing a lasting hatred for those down there in the capital. When Marcello received his father's body, the event was a poignant reminder of his loss, a memory that would haunt him. Seven years after the ordeal, Marcello found himself in another intense situation, facing scrutiny at a Senate hearing led by Robert F. Kennedy. This encounter further solidified his adversarial stance against the political figures who had caused him so much personal anguish. 
The 1960s marked an intense period of conflict against organized crime, yet many of the top mob bosses, including Carlos Marcelo, seemed untouchable, their wealth and power unscathed by the legal system. Despite these apparent victories, Marcelo faced a significant setback during this era, prompting him to counterattack against the FBI and other authorities targeting him. It was during this time that some of Marcello's political shields, like Jim Garrison, came under FBI scrutiny. Garrison, sensing the danger, sought Marcello's protection, aligning their interests against the pressures from Washington. This partnership deepened when Garrison, unexpectedly flush with cash, initiated a private investigation into the Kennedy assassination, a move that aligned with Marcello's need to manage leaks and potential threats. Marcello orchestrated what was termed a fishing expedition to identify and manage individuals who could either be dangerous or useful to his cause. Those who threatened to incriminate him were eliminated, while those promoting theories of a broader conspiracy, which could divert attention from Marcello's activities, were spared. This strategy led to the silencing of many witnesses who could have provided a cohesive account of the events surrounding Kennedy's assassination including individuals closely tied to Marcello. David Ferry, a key figure linked to Marcello, found himself in a precarious position when he communicated with Garrison without Marcello's knowledge. In the underworld, Marcello dominated. Failing to inform the boss about interactions with authorities was tantamount to signing one's own death warrant. Ferry's oversight, compounded by his engagement with Garrison without the presence of Marcello's lawyers, sealed his fate. A few days after the assassination, when Garrison spoke to Ferry, Ferry was initially accompanied by a lawyer, Jack Wasserman, Marcello's chief legal defender, highlighting the tight controls Marcello maintained over his associates' interactions with law enforcement and legal authorities. As Jim Garrison's investigation into the Kennedy assassination gained momentum in 1967 and 1968, Carlos Marcello worked diligently to solidify his position within the criminal underworld. He convened a strategic meeting with notable figures such as Santo Traficante, Joseph Colombo, and key members of his own organization, including his lawyers Jack Wasserman and Frank Regano, as well as Frank Gagliano, Anthony Carolla, and his brother Joseph Marcello. They gathered at La Stella restaurant, symbolically completing a meal they never ordered previously as a bold statement of defiance against the authorities in Washington, asserting their innocence and untouchability. Carlo Gambino was notably absent due to illness, yet Marcello ensured his alliance was known. Despite this show of strength, Marcello faced increasing pressure. The state of Louisiana began to take actions against him. Although he had effectively corrupted the state legislature to neutralize potential threats, this period also saw Marcello coming under fire from the media, with Life magazine in 1967 alleging his involvement in a $2 million fund aimed at freeing Jimmy Hoffa from prison. The magazine further accused him of manipulating Louisiana senators, exposing the depth of his influence and the challenges he faced with increasing public scrutiny. Further complicating Marcello's situation was the exposure of his criminal syndicate's involvement in gambling sports rigging, union manipulation, and political corruption. Additional reports highlighted the syndicate's operations in the Bahamas, revealing early indications of the islands being used as hubs for cocaine smuggling into the United States, a precursor to the massive drug trafficking operations that would dominate the 70s and 80s. Marcello was a pioneer in many respects, not only in gambling and real estate, but also in narcotics trafficking. He established new drug trafficking routes into America, making early connections with Mexican cartels and working closely with the French Corsican Mafia. His operations in the South became the heart of money laundering, which remained largely under the radar of authorities like Robert Kennedy. Understanding Carlos Marcello's influence requires an appreciation for the criminal infrastructure of the South, where his power extended far beyond traditional mob activities. New Orleans, in contrast to New York's Murder Incorporated, boasted connections with right-wing militia, 
ready to support Marcello's operations. These militias were instrumental in training Cuban exiles for the CIA, highlighting Marcello's significant involvement in and contributions to covert operations, including the Bay of Pigs invasion. Marcello's extensive CIA connections and his eventual exposure alongside the Gambino crime family in the savings and loan crisis further underscore his complex and far-reaching influence in American organized crime and beyond. During the tumultuous period between June 1967 and 1968, as Jim Garrison's investigation into the Kennedy assassination was winding down, another seismic event would captivate and horrify the American public. One of Carlos Marcello's most prominent adversaries in the realms of politics and civil rights, Martin Luther King Jr., was tragically assassinated. The connections between this event and the South, including its implications and motivations, will be explored in depth in my upcoming documentary on Marcello. Shortly after the loss of Martin Luther King Jr., another stunning tragedy occurred. Robert Kennedy, a formidable opponent of Marcello who had once had him deported, was also assassinated. These back-to-back -back assassinations left the nation reeling and marked a profound period of upheaval in American history. Meanwhile, Jimmy Hoffa was incarcerated, closely following reports in Life, Time, Look and other magazines that detailed significant financial misappropriations from the casinos he had helped finance. These revelations were unfolding as the 70s dawned, heralding a new era of conflict within organized crime. This forthcoming struggle would claim the lives of established figures, such as Sam Giancana, Jimmy Hoffa, and Johnny Roselli, among others, who would not live to see the outcome of this burgeoning war. This series of events underscores the volatile intersection of organized crime, politics, and civil rights movements during a pivotal era in American history. My documentary will delve into these complex relationships and their lasting impact on the nation, offering insights into the forces that shaped these turbulent times. I am currently developing a documentary on Maya Lansky, and once that is complete, I will delve into the story of Carlo Gambino. This sequence will provide a comprehensive understanding of organized crime's evolution in New York, showcasing figures like Frank Costello, Lansky and Gambino, and illustrating how Lucky Luciano laid the groundwork for modern organized crime. Lansky became the financial wizard, pioneering the syndicate's banking operations, while Gambino emerged as the ultimate ruler of New York's underworld, highlighting the distinct roles each played within the Mafia's infrastructure. Next, we will explore the Chicago outfit under the leadership of Tony Accardo and Paul Rica. This segment will reveal how the outfit dominated Hollywood, controlled major unions, and engaged in widespread political corruption, featuring ingenious gangsters like Jake Guzik and others who, like Al Capone and Luciano, embraced diversity, recruiting individuals regardless of race or religion. Understanding Chicago's mafia scene sets the stage to compare it with the Southern Mafia, particularly focusing on Santo Traficante in Florida and Miami, and Carlos Marcello in New Orleans. The series will conclude with an in-depth look at Marcello, exploring the comprehensive war on organized crime initiated by the Kennedy administration, which Marcello escalated by orchestrating the Kennedy assassination. This act marked the beginning of a new war, pitting the press, Washington, and eventually the American public against the Mafia. Despite the crackdown, figures like Gambino, Accardo, Rica, Costello, and Marcello managed to avoid significant prison time, maintaining their power and wealth. This series aims to unravel the complexities of Marcello's operations, the extent of corruption in the South, and how these criminal networks influence politics in New York, Illinois, and beyond. By examining each criminal syndicate, viewers will gain insights into the Mafia's powerful influence, extending from the era of Luciano to the political machinations of Marcello, demonstrating how these figures became so powerful that they could sway presidential elections. This journey through organized crime's history,
from New York to Chicago and the South, will offer a detailed understanding of its evolution and enduring impact on American society.